Has HGR helped you in any way? Help us help others by becoming a monthly sponsor. No amount is too small. You can make a one-time donation or become a monthly sponsor. To donate to HGR, visit www.holyghostradio.com forward slash donate. That's www.holyghostradio.com forward slash donate. Or call 623-262-5121. That's 623-262-5121. That's 623-262-5121. No amount is too small. You can make a one-time donation or become a monthly sponsor. Help us help others by becoming a monthly sponsor. We will begin with uh, Jacob and Jacob's trouble. But I want to pick up at the 8th chapter of the uh, book of Revelation. And I'm going to uh, pick up one verse there because the question has been asked. When it opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And the half an hour is a correct translation from the Greek. What is that? Turn with me to the 15th chapter just for comparison and the 8th verse and you'll read something similar to it happening in Revelation 15 and 8. This is some of the, uh, when the vials are fixing to pour it out, be poured out. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. You've got something similar. When uh, things are shown in the book of Revelation going on on earth, heaven generally is silent. And when something goes on in heaven, of course there is no such thing as silence upon earth, but at least I believe that it depicts a, a uh, reverence in heaven for the atrocities that are happening, up, happening upon men upon the earth. And the silence is because terrible things are fixing to happen in this seventh seal. The trumpets are fixing to sound, and so heaven is silent. And just before the vials are poured out in the 15th chapter, it's almost like it again. They are the worst of the uh, wrath of God. And so almost God's pity, God's hand, uh, God shutting everything off for a moment. Would we call it a moment of reverence for what is going on? The temple was closed down in heaven and no man could go into the temple till the vile were shut. Silence in heaven and a stoppage of worship in the temple while those terrible things were happening upon the earth. Have you got it? It's simple, isn't it? Because those two comparisons let you know really what's happening. No man can go in the temple in heaven until the terrible vials are poured out. Heaven is silent and quiet. A half hour, almost like us standing in, uh, in uh, 30 minutes of silence uh, for the Vietnam casualties and the children that are dying there tonight. It's almost as though we would do that here in church. And that's sort of what is happening now. Have you ever seen that before? I don't believe you have. Amen. Thank God. All right, I'm going now. Uh, the ninth chapter, we gave you the trumpets. We've already covered that. I must pick up with the 10th chapter to begin our study of Jacob and Jacob's trouble. And I'm not going to read it to you. You can read it at your leisure if you've got any of that. And uh, take it home for yourself. But here is what is in the 10th chapter. It is parenthetical. You that have uh, a certain kind of Bible will see that. It is parenthetical. It is set in between. Uh, we are coming to a halting place. We're coming to a place where we look backwards and forwards in the book of Revelation. 
We're coming to the halfway point. We're coming to the middle of the week. And I'll prove to you in just a moment that the 11th, 12th, and 13th chapters of Revelations are the middle of the week. The middle of what is called tribulation. I prefer to call it Daniel's 70th week or Jeremiah 37, Jacob's trouble. It has nothing to do with the church. The church is raptured in the fourth chapter of Revelation. That that is poured out upon this is Jacob's trouble for the purpose of turning the Jews back to God. As prophesied in Malachi 4 and 5, they will turn back to God. And uh, I will be on Romans 11 tonight, so I will not, go, I will not quote that uh, here at this time to show you that the Gentiles will be gone, the Gentile church, and God will be turning back to the Jews. Now, there is a prophecy, Malachi 4 and 5, that says, I will send Elijah before that great and terrible day, and he shall turn the hearts of the children back to the father, fathers of the children. Jesus, quoting it, said he will restore all things. And they said, if you listen to it, John will do the same thing for you right now. You won't have to wait for Elijah. A lot of them misunderstood and thought he said that John was Elijah rather incarnate in flesh. But he didn't say that. He was saying to the Jews, you won't have to wait for Elijah to come. If you will, you can have from God what you will have when Elijah comes now. Elijah. I said, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't say that. Oh, he said, you didn't? He said, no. He said, well, I believe he was. I said, I'm going to ask you one question. Did John restore all things and turn the hearts of the Jews to God? He said, no. I said, ain't him then. Because Malachi 4 and 5 says he will. But Jesus says, if you will have it, John can do for you what Elijah will do for you in that time. So that prophecy is coming. Now, if there is any prophecy that the Jews look forward to, it is the return of Elijah. And they were the ones that asked him, when will Elijah come and turn the heart? The Jews knew that prophecy. So that's when Jesus said, if you will have it, John can do it for you now. <coughs> that's a sweet thing to them. All right. Now, this vision of the little book in the 10th chapter is somewhat symbolical of something good happening and it turning out bad. Because John was told to take a book and it's just like it was to Ezekiel. It happened to him the same way. Eat that little book. And when he ate the little book, at first it was like honey in his mouth was very sweet. And first of all, it's very for them to think about Moses and Elijah are fixing to come and preach to us. That's very sweet. But after they digest what Moses and Elijah have to say, it's kind of bitter because they don't want to believe what Moses and Elijah are fixing to say. So the 10th chapter is almost like saying, uh, we're saying, uh, you know, we're going to have a visitor. Oh, good, oh, good, that's good news. And that visitor is from Uncle Sam, the infernal revenue. This is the last night that you've got on earth. Amen. And all of a sudden it gets bitter in your stomach when you, when you uh, realize what the message really is and who the visitor is. That's what's happening in the 10th chapter of Revelation. It's good because we're going to have this message and this prophecy. But it's bad when we find out what it is. And I will tell you what that prophecy is in just a few moments. Well, let's go into it. In the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, I want to, I want to do one thing before I go through it, uh, before I begin reading any of it. I want to skip down and tell you some verses to pick out, first of all, from uh, the 11th chapter and the 12th chapter and the 13th chapter. And what I'm going to do with these verses is prove to you that you've got 42 months left in the world 
you've got three and a half years left, or you've got 1,260 days left. I want to show you that we're middle way. For in 11 and 2, the latter part of the verse, you read that the city shall be trodden underfoot 40 and 2 months. There's the first mention of the time element. And then the time element is mentioned again in the 12th chapter and the 6th verse, speaking of the woman, that she should be fed in the wilderness a thousand two hundred and three score days, that's 1260 days. Once again in the 14th chapter, or pardon me, the 12th chapter, the 14th verse of Revelation, it mentions she is nourished for a time and time and half a time. And you have the singular, the dual, and the half time. Then in the 13th chapter and the 5th verse, you have it mentioning the beast ruling for 42 months again. This is mentioned there. So I have given you four places in these chapters where it tells you there is 42 months, three and a half years, or 1260 days. So we know we're halfway when we get to the 11th to the 13th chapter, we're halfway. In the 13th chapter is where the beast is described. Actually, that's when he comes in to Jerusalem, if you will. Daniel says that he fights from the time he makes the covenant with the northern confederacy. I've got these battles drawn. From the time he's introduced, and this is the Antichrist with his, uh, with his tight style and dress that he's got acceptable to the world. These are the wars that he fights with Rosh, with the countries that I had you named tonight. Then he, he conquers those countries. Then Daniel says he enters into the glorious land. And then there is 42 months. How long until that vision be accomplished, Daniel? For a time and times and a half a time. All right. So I come to the middle of the book of Revelation and I find that times and times, half a time, and lo, in the 13th chapter, the beast rises out of the sea and out of the land and he is in Jerusalem and starts working in the temple right there. Can you see how beautifully Daniel describes him coming at the half of the week into Jerusalem and then Revelation describes him coming at the half of the week as well. The last battle, of course, course is fought. I will go in a moment to the other chapters and describe uh, uh, this beast just a little more that is going to be coming. But uh, we are going to the 11th chapter. Now, why? I mentioned, is there going to be a seven-year period? Why? I'll ask this again. Why doesn't Jesus just come, take us home, judge the world, and it be done with? Because there are seven covenants that were made to the Jews that have got to be fulfilled. You, and, and, and I could name the seven, the Edenic, the Adamic, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, the Davidic, and, uh, and uh, some others I can't name. But I want to name the few to you that are important to this hour. First of all is the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, 13, verse 14, chapter 15 and 4, chapter 17 and 1, chapter 22 and 17, that's in Genesis. And the Palestinian covenant. Now the Abrahamic covenant said you are going to have a seed as the sand of the seashore and the stars of the sky. And it is in that covenant in Genesis that he says they shall rule from the great river of Egypt unto the Euphrates. And once again, I point out, here's the Mediterranean. Here is Jerusalem, Galilee. And uh, Brother Bill had a great thought last night. We're fixing to make some, some uh, dog ear flip charts that'll come down from the top of here. When I need them, I'll reach up and get them. And one of them be a map. And so the next time we teach it, we're going to have a bunch of different things. But here's the Euphrates. And the great river of Egypt is down here somewhere. This is the millennium boundary. The Jews have never had that promise fulfilled, but they shall. That is the Abrahamic covenant. Then the Palestinian covenant does about the same thing. And I could give you scriptures if you want that. 
The Davidic covenant promises, there shall not fail you a man on the throne. And when we get into the millennium, I'm going to show you the kind of worship they'll have, and I'll show you a temple, I'll describe the temple, and I'll describe a prince coming through that temple and being worshipped. And you'll want to hear about that. Then, of course, the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, tells us about it as well. And so these covenants have got to be fulfilled. God says you're going to plant gardens and your, your crops and somebody's not going to take it away from you. You're going to have all nations come and you're going to rule them. And they're going to come up to the temple. Ten men are going to take a hold of the skirt of him that's a Jew and say, we hear that God is with you. We shall go up and worship. And so those promises have got to be fulfilled. And God is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is faithful. Thank God. And so these promises have been made to the Jew. God has made them. And Paul tells us He will bring them in again for the purpose of these promises that He has made to them. Many of these promises will go right on into eternity. That's the reason that you'll have a new heaven and a new earth. And I'll describe that and tell you why it is said like that when we get there. You want to hear it? Nod your head if you do. Thursday night, we'll get there. All right. Now then, in the 11th chapter, we're going to talk about God turning back to the Jew and how it's going to be done. He says, I was given a rod and told to measure the temple and uh, he measured it. But don't measure the court because it's given to the Gentiles for them to trade it down for 42 months. So they got 42 months left. That was my first mention. Then I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. There you've got the days mentioned. I know how long a prophetic year is by how many days are in 42 months. It's able, it, it, you're able to figure it out. All right. Now these are two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. It is almost similar to the description that is given in Zechariah of these two witnesses. However, John goes a little more into detail to describe these two men. Now these are two men that come. They have power uh, to hurt those that hurt them. And it mentions the days of their prophecy. And for those who believe that these men are just two Jews that are going to come, you need to understand that these have power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And this uh, have power is in the aorist sense, I understand, which is a past punctual action. It is not present. It is not now. But uh, that action took place in the day of their prophecy. Now, Alfred in the Greek calls for these next chapters as them being somewhat backward and forward looking. And there are some landmarks for the type of interpretation that we have. And when I get to it in a moment, you'll understand what I'm saying. What he's saying is there is no need to try to make something out of this that's not. Who had power in the days of their prophecy to shut up heaven that it rained not? Elijah. Who did Jesus say, I will send before that great and terrible day and will restore all things? Elijah. So why fuss about it? It's Elijah. The next one that is mentioned, the two witnesses, says that he has power over the waters to turn them to blood, and the antecedent of, of course, that is the same in the day of his prophecy. Well, who had that power? Moses? Who stood on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah? Moses. Now, somebody said, couldn't it be Enoch and Elijah? I'm a little inquisitive. Why Enoch? I am answered because he and Elijah did not die. So they will have to come back and die. I'm going to ask you, do you really know what happened to Enoch and Elijah? Are you really ready to say? I'm going to ask you this. Did something happen to them different than what happened to Moses? 
I think not, because Moses seemed as in good a help as Elijah did on the Mount of Transfiguration. The whole thing, as far as I'm concerned, is an anthropomorphism, and you almost have to gargle that one, which means God appearing to do a thing. I think really, and I, 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 should, say, I should say this, I think it's said of Moses that he died and God buried him. But the different thing about Moses and everybody else has died, uh, uh, James says that the angels have a fuss every now and then with the devil about the body of Moses. They dispute with him about the body of Moses. He evidently knows where everybody else is buried but Moses. Frankly, I think that God buried him is the same kind of statement as God taking Elijah up into heaven by a whirlwind or that Elijah was not, he was translated. I think the same thing happened between them because the devil don't know where Moses is and he knows where everybody else is. And once again, I repeat, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses stood with Elijah in good health and here he's standing in the last days. And by the way, Enoch represented nothing. You have in Elijah the prophet, you have in Moses the law, the law and the prophet, and that is what the Jews believed in. Unto the law and the prophet, if any man speak otherwise, amen, let it be unto him a curse. Unto the law and the prophet, if any man speak otherwise, he is of course a curse. So the two prophets, and I'd be glad to talk with you more about it if you want to, <laughs> out of the way. These two come and they begin to preach. And just like that book, oh, everybody was glad. There's Moses and Elijah. Good old Moses and Elijah. We've been going to the Wailing Wall for years asking them to come. And so here they finally now they've come. And what does Isaiah say that they're going to say? They shall hear a voice behind them. A voice shall come from behind them and say, turn around. You've gone too far. Look back. You passed him up 2,000 years ago. The Messiah you're looking for, you passed him up. Go back. We're told that these men, after the two prophets prophesied of them, they worshiped the Lamb, which is, of course, representative of the manhood of Jesus Christ. They are convinced. That Jesus is the Messiah. They'll hear a voice behind them, Isaiah said, saying, Turn around. Look back. You passed him up. You went by him. Oh no, we don't like that. <laughs> We're glad you come, Moses and Elijah, but we don't like what you're saying. It's sweet in the mouth, but it's bitter in the belly when we digest what you're saying. Alright? So, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit and really is a statement from hell that he's from hell and that's what it is has power over these two to kill them and everybody's real happy oh good good we're glad we're glad that he is dead because these fellows tormented us and the Bible said they're so happy about it they send presents to one another like it is Christmas time Everybody's happy. Moses and Elijah come back. We was glad to come. They told us Jesus was the Messiah. So we're sad about it. And we're glad that they're dead. And they don't even bury them. They just let them lie in the street. But my Lord has something to prove about himself. And that's what Paul said. If Christ raised from the dead, then we have hope. Amen. He wants to prove that he has resurrection power. And that that Jesus that they put in the tomb had the power to come out of there. So it's strange that after three days, the same time Jesus was in the belly of the earth, these two witnesses come up. Somebody said, now we've had this happen twice to us. 2,000 years ago, we had a man we buried and put a seal on his tomb. And lo and behold, after three days he come out of there. And now here comes Moses and Elijah and tells us that Jesus is the one. The beast kills them. After three days, they get up from the ground. And they start going up. And brother, when they start going up, a sword comes out of their mouth and devours everybody that's around them, that's against them. 
And you know what the remnant does? That's 144,000 Jews, and I'll prove it. Fall on their face, and they give doke or glory to God. They're convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm telling you, you'll find out Thursday night that there's a whole lot hinging on the fact that Jesus did resurrect from the dead. Hallelujah. There's more hinging on His getting up from the ground than you have imagined. Because if He didn't, I won't. And you won't. Paul says we won't. Our hope is vain. Our preaching is vain. You are yet in your sins and your loved ones will not be resurrected. And we might as well go home and have a party, paraphrasing it, and forget it. Because, because if He didn't rise from the dead. But I'm going to tell you what, He did get up from the dead. And he proves he's got the power to do it with these two witnesses. They, they say, it happened again. We are plagued with, with, with resurrection. Amen. The Jews say we're having resurrection all over the place. We make a mistake every time. So they go ahead and give glory to God. When these two come from the ground, the Bible said the power of Joe, which is life, and it is the same thing in him, is Joe. In him is life, and that life became the light, and it shined forth in the darkness, and the darkness could not take hold upon it. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah! But these two witnesses, thank God, convinced the Jews that they, of course, should believe that Christ uh, is the Messiah. All right. Then after this, let me read on down, if you will, the seventh trumpet sound. And everybody that's in heaven begins to sing. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of God. The four and twenty elders, which represent the saved of the Old and New Testament, fell on their faces. They're always falling on their faces. That's wonderful, isn't it? They fall on their faces and give glory to God and say, You are the Almighty which was not to come. Thank God thou hast taken to thee great power in His reign. The nations are angry and the wrath has come. And the time of the dead they should be judged. Thou shouldest give reward unto the servant, the prophet, and to the holy ones, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God is open in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament. I told you last night, this book of Revelation has a lot of New Testament language, but it's got some Old Testament language too. The ark of the covenant, which belongs to the Jews, is opened in heaven. All right. I come down to one of the most debated chapters in the book of Revelations there are. How many think you understand the 11th chapter being the conversion of the remnant? The remnant fall on their face and give glory to God. And the word remnant is hoi poloi, which means the rest are the remaining ones. Fall on their face and give glory to God. Now, I believe that, uh, that really the 12th chapter is the direct middle of the book. And I have agreeing with me several scholars such as Afford, and I refer to him mostly because his commentary upon the Greek text have hardly ever been superseded. I have, uh, I have uh, several others that I consult for this kind of thing. But he says the 12th chapter is rather a backward look and a forward look. A panoramic view of the entire Jewish Situation because we are in the middle of the week and we are going to take a backward look. So he goes all the way back to there appeared a great wonder to heaven, a woman clothed with a sun and the moon under her feet and under upon her head was a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, prevailing in birth and pain to be delivered. The way that you prove that that woman is Israel, it is the same vision that Joseph had when he told his daddy, I had a dream. I had a dream that under my feet were these stars and the moon. And I was ruling over this. I had this same dream about it. And sure enough, he ruled over his brethren and they didn't like it. There is no one that argues. I have not met anyone that debates who the woman is. The woman is Israel with the sun and the moon under her feet and with Twelve stars, or crown of twelve stars on her head, representing the twelve tribes of Israel. The same dream that Joseph had and told to his father Israel. Now, and no one debates who the next one is. Satan. 
That, uh, and if you have uh, a Scofield Bible, yours will tell you that the woman is Israel and the red dragon with the seven head and ten horns. And notice there is an eclipsing. The, and and brother, brother Bill, bless his heart, he said, we've got to paint that dude red because we've got him green. Amen. All right, we'll paint him red. We wanted to make a little bit of something not uh, fierce here. But we've got seven heads and ten, uh, 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 ten crowns or horns or whatever it is. But it goes right along with the vision of Daniel of that beast that rises. Really, it is the devil. And there is no discussion. I've read book after book after book, and I have not found anybody that doesn't believe that the woman is Israel and that the dragon is the devil. I've not found anybody. But when we get down to that man, child, brother, the good time that we start having. But if you will only follow it through with the simple exegesis and, and interpretation that you've begun with, you will have no trouble. You that have Schofield Bible, once again, will see that she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nation with a rod of iron. Somebody get me Psalms 2, if you will, and be ready to read it for me right now, Ricky Ryan, in just a moment. All right. And her child was caught up unto God and to His throne. This woman was going to bring forth this child. You that have Schofield, read the child is Christ. That's it. The woman of Israel brought forth that man-child. All right. Now, I run into a preacher not long ago that said he believed that the man-child was the remnant, the 144,000. I've heard him say they believe that it is the church. But uh, I want to point out to you that the church is not referred to generally in a, in a masculine sense. And the correct translation, the correct wording for this is she brought forth a male son. It is neither man nor child here. Back up in the second verse, she brought forth a child. It is technon in the Greek there. But down here, it is arson weon, which means a male child. Now, if I am going to say a man, in differentiating between man and animal and other beasts, I say anthropos. If I am going to say a man in difference between a man and a woman, I say arson or arsenos, either one. This makes it a definite stipulation of gender. It is of male gender. He brought forth a definitely singular male son. All right? Does that help you out? brought forth a male son who was caught up to God. Who was the male son that came from Israel that was resurrected and caught up to God? I believe it was Christ. If I had Alfred here tonight, I would read it. I have got it in the office and I started to bring it and read it. But I can quote it to you. <clears throat> he goes on down and here's what he has to say. And who was to rule all nations? The word who there in the Greek is hos. It is a relative pronoun and a pronoun of personal identification. And he said, here is a landmark to determine whether you interpret the Bible true or to your own welfare and life. He said, so far, everyone agrees that the woman is Israel and that the dragon is the devil. It just appears that way you take it. If you come down and take that son that the woman brought forth and make it any other thing than what is simply understood, then you are stepping beyond and are going into error because he said the host, which is a relative pronoun, showing personal identification of a male son will throw you into an era. As far as I'm concerned, you're making the biggest blunder on Bible interpretation to say it is any more than the male son who was caught up or who shall rule, uh, the, who was caught up to God's throne and shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. Read me who we're quoting from. Who was this talking from? Read it in Psalms. This is a messianic psalm of David. Read it. All right, they take counsel against the Lord and his anointed, saying, All right, read on. All right, 
All right? So the word there is break. He shall rule is the word break. It is the same word used in Psalm. He shall break the nation. Here it says, He shall break the nation. I don't believe the saints, I don't believe the Jews will ever break the nation or shatter the nation. I believe there's only one that can break the nation, and that is that male son who came forth from Israel and was caught up to God and his throne. Now, I will be on that probably a little more tomorrow night with a little more definite instruction about that. Now, the woman flees into the wilderness, and she has a place prepared of God that should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. So now I've got the woman, I've got the devil, and I've got Christ, which is crucified and is resurrected. Now then, I come back to the woman. We have kind of taken care of her history. So we come back to the woman. And uh, the woman flees in the wilderness. That's what we showed you. That's the reason that Edom and Moab is going to be spared by the Antichrist. Because Edom and Moab uh, involves the same wilderness where the Jews were in one time. And he says, I will hide them there again. I told you last night that Isaiah said, uh, relative to Edom and Moab, take in my outcast. Take in my outcast. And be thou a covert to them, O Edom and Moab, until the storm be passes over. Thank God. So God is going to preserve them. He's going to read how it is to be done. Just a little bit later on, how uh, that the woman is going to go into the wilderness. All right, there once again. She's going in the middle of the week, and God's going to take her to the wilderness. This is the Jews in general. This is Israel in general. All right. Then there's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and against the angels and prevail not. Neither was there found any more place in heaven. And the dragon was cast out. The old serpent called the devil, Satan, which deceived the whole earth. He was cast under the earth and his angels was cast with him. I believe that this is a historical view, once again, of what Isaiah saw. I saw the devil cast out of heaven. And that is where he drew some with him. He said in Isaiah, I will be like the Most High. I will be above the throne of God. I will be like God. The five I wills of the devil in Isaiah. I believe this is a backward look at the devil. And then he brings us up to date with him. And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers cast down which accused them before the throne day and night and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb thank God and by the word of the testimony they love not the lies unto death but therefore the, uh, he says rejoice in heaven ye that dwell in them woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea for the devil is coming down unto you having great power because he knows that he has a short time some of you remember me preaching on the frantics of the Satan he gets all worried sometimes. He don't know everything, and so he gets all disturbed. But he knows he's got a short while. All right. Now, when the devil saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth uh, the male son. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly in the wilderness into her place. And when you read of that woman going into the place, it brings you up to a specific time and a specific place. Otherwise, it could be her history. Otherwise, it could be before. But when it says that she is given that for uh, 1,260 days, that means we're talking about her right now going in to the end time. This is the woman Israel, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his, of his mouth waters of flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Here is another thing. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the rest or the remaining ones of her seed. What was the first seed she had? The first seed she had was the male son. The second seed and the rest of the seed will be the 144,000 sealed of the twelve tribes of Israel from the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation that we've already got for you. All right. Now then, there was, uh, I think that uh, you've got it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I'm identifying tonight some personages for you. We've got it down in our mind. 
The woman is Israel. The dragon is the devil. The male son is Jesus Christ. Is caught up to God. The woman then is persecuted by the devil and she is taken into the wilderness. And that wilderness is right in here where God's going to take care of her for 42 months or 1,260 days, at least while the beast is in Jerusalem. That are the Jews in general. Israel shall be there in general. But I believe that the 144,000 are going to be killed because I read in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation that, uh, pardon me, it was the 13th chapter, that this Antichrist has power in the 7th verse given to him to make war with the holy ones, which is 144,000, and to overcome them, which means to win a victory militarily in the original word. So we've got it down uh, at least that far. And uh, she flees into the wilderness for 42 months. And then the devil returns and makes war with the remnant of the seed. And I read in the 13th chapter I just read to you where that the beast has power to overcome them. I read later on about the 144,000 that they are standing on a sea of glass before God and they sing a song that nobody else can sing. The angels, nor the elders, nor the church, or anybody else can sing that song. And the Bible said they sing a song, the original says, that was taught them by Moses and by Christ. Thank God. Now we know Christ, but Moses didn't mean all that much. But these people believe in Moses. They really believe in Moses. But after those two witnesses come down and perform their duty and their testimony, they're going to follow the Lamb, the Bible said, wherever He goes. And they're going to sing a new song about Moses and the Lamb. We're convinced now that Jesus is the Messiah. Thank God. And so they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Say, praise the Lord. I went through last night the 13th chapter with you. That is the rise of the beast from the sea, which is the ten federation nations, which is the beast of the end time. And I believe that it is very close to what is incorporated today in the common market when the United States is included. Then the one that comes from the land is the representative. He does everything in the sight of the first beast and for the first beast. He makes an image of that first beast and makes everybody worship that image. And if they don't worship that image, and if they don't take that mark or number or name, you can have either one of the three, or number or number, or name or mark. You can have any one of the three, then, of course, you are killed. We had that. And I told you who and what the uh, 666 was as to my estimation. The 14th chapter now, we're going to go back into heaven we're going, to, we're going to look into heaven. Who are you going to see? We're going to see, you notice in the 7th verse, it was given the beast to make war. That is in the 13th chapter, the 7th verse. It was given to him to make war and overcome the saints. Now you look in the 14th chapter and you're going to see those saints standing on the other side. Who are they? I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000. And you read from the 7th chapter of the book of Revelation that the 144,000 are of the 12 tribes of Israel, of the tribe of Gad, Dan, uh, not Dan, pardon me, Asher, uh, Zebulun, Isaac, Nephthalim, Manasseh. Joseph takes the place of Dan because Dan was steeped in idolatry. And so they stand having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now I heard a voice as from heaven, the voice of many waters, the voice of a great trumpet. I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And as I told you, they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and before the elders, which are the representatives of the church. No man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand that were redeemed from the earth. These are which are not defiled with women. And I preached from that the other night, so I'll not go into it. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These are redeemed from among men, being the first fruit. These are Jews, in other words. In their mouth was found no lie, nor pseudo, which is lie or guile, for they are without fault, and before the throne of God is added, it is not in the original. Interpolation. All right. <laughs> I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Now, the preaching of them which dwell upon the earth, so that every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. I've got to stop here long enough.
Somebody and everybody wants to know what gospel are they preaching. It is not the gospel of the Holy Ghost. Because when the church is gone, that gospel is not going to be preached anymore. You do not find the word church mentioned in the book of Revelation after the third chapter until the tribulation is over. It's not mentioned again. You do not find the tempest. You do not find baptism. You do not find the Holy Ghost after the third chapter of Revelation until after the tribulation. This is dealing with the Jews. It is the turning of them back to God. There's two witnesses come and preach to them and convert them and to give glory to God. We see them standing in heaven saying, singing a new song about Moses and the land. All right. Thank God. So, what message is being preached? Well, let me tie this in and show you. You remember I told you that Jesus went into the temple, took the book from the hand of the preacher, and he read to him from Isaiah 65, 61, and here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set it into them the captive, and to bind the broken heart, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Boom! He stopped in the middle of the verse, pulled the book up, handed it back to the minister and sat down. And the Bible said, all eyes were fastened on him. Why didn't he keep reading? Because in his first mission to earth, it was of just mercy. I've come to bind the brokenhearted, to set folk free. I've come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to bind the broken heart. But brother, one of these days, he's going to take that book again, and he's going to begin to read it again. And the Bible said when he reads it, the next verse says, And the day of vengeance of our God. Now, who preaches the gospel of mercy and judgment? Men. Mercy and love. Pardon me. Mercy and love. Preach it. You and I preach that gospel. The tidings. Who's going to preach this one of judgment? Angels. It won't be men. Mine tonight is not to start telling you that judgment is here tonight. I'm telling you that judgment has come. And everybody fear God. Here's the message they say. Fear God and give glory for the day of this judgment has come. See what I mean? But that's not my message. My message is this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners' sons beneath that flood lose all their guilt is saying. I preach Calvary. I preach redemption. I preach that judgment is coming, but it's not here now. But the everlasting gospel is going to be preached not by men, but by angels. And they're going to say, fall on your face and give glory to God because the day of his judgment has come. Thank God, that is the everlasting gospel. Have you ever seen it before? I've had that asked me time and time again. And I hope that you are able uh, to understand it from what that I have given you then. Now, now the beast is doomed. The beast is doomed. You've got in the rest of it, the uh, worship, the doom of the beast worshipers are pronounced. And that goes on to the rest of it. The fall of Babylon is announced. Now, I've got this depicted here. Babylon really is the beast. You've got the Antichrist depicted here, the ten toes, the ten horns, and the little horn. You've got him depicted here. You've got him depicted as, as the dragon with seven head and ten horns. You've got him depicted here in, in uh, the 17th, 18th, 19th, uh, 17th, 18th chapter. Uh, uh, pardon me. Yes. As a lion with seven heads and ten horns once again, because seven heads is seven mountains on which Rome sits, and the ten horns, the ten kings, which perceive power with him for one hour. But there's an old woman riding him, and she calls herself the mama, the mother. But the Bible calls her the mother of harlots. It is the ecclesiastical part of Rome. It is the church part of Rome. And she's got in her hand a cup. And it's wine, but it's really, the Bible said, the blood of saints that she has martyred. Prophets and preachers, she's full of it. She's got that cup in her hand. Now these ten kings are going to go along with that old, old silly woman for a while. It's really silly. She is politically a power at heart. 
but she still tries to hold on, and you can do anything you want to in the world, just come tell somebody about it. Pay your penny in the offering, pay in your penance, and, and, and I'm not knocking anybody, I'm talking about a system and a religious system, if you please. But you do your penance, and that's all, take care of it, you see. But it still holds, it's really paganistic, but she still holds on a little bit to something kind of old-fashioned, like Jesus Christ every now and then, you know. And they'll do the Hail Mary and put Jesus in there with her. But they'll still hold, and it's kind of a, a silly position. Now, I'm going to tell you what, if I'm going to go out and live it up and drink and corral, I'm not going to go tell nobody about it. When I get ready to quit, I'll come before an altar and repent and tell my God all about it, and he'll forgive me. I've got that in my Bible. Hallelujah. But these ten nations, the Bible says, really hate her. Now, I'm not going to read everything, but uh, you're going down in the 14th chapter, and you've got the rest of the, uh, the worshipers of the beast image. Then you've got the vision of Armageddon. Then you've got the seven vials that begin to be poured out. And I'm not going to cover the seven vials because they're depicted boils, blood on the sea, blood on the rivers, great heat, darkness, your freight teas, which is the last battle, preparing the way for the kings of the east, the last battle, which is Armageddon and hell. You've got those things that are coming. But now if you'll go to the 17th chapter, we're going to start seeing the different views of Babylon. We're going to start looking at that old woman and uh, great Mr. Babylon. And of course, Babylon uh, is confusion. It comes from Babel, which means house of God. But when you change it that much, it becomes confusion. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints. That's what's in that cup. She has a wine glass in her hand. But that really is the blood of saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus Christ. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. The beast thou sawest, which was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and to go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and that is Rome, built on seven hills. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, one is yet to come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. The beast that was and is not, he is of the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. All those verses are saying is, there are several kings here, and then there cometh another, but the eighth one is of the seventh one. In other words, the Antichrist, which is from the beast from the sea, is of the one from, or the beast from the land is of the one from the sea. One is from the other. And he takes over the power of these other kingdoms, but he is the final and the last one. The ten horns which thou sawest, the ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but have received power as kings one hour or a short while with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These ten nations. Then shall they make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. He saith unto me, The water which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall eat, um, or shall make her desolate, and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth and Rome rule longer over the earth than anybody else did. All right. Even longer than the United States and we hadn't ruled the whole world. We tried a little bit. Tried to help them out at least and hadn't done that. Amen. But these kings that are here these ten federations, they really hate that old woman part of Rome. They really hate the religious part of her because it's a drag. This one fellow that's going to be the ambassador, he is going to be one that doesn't care for any god but himself. And so that old woman is going to be a hold back to him. You see what I'm talking about? All right. The Bible says that he is a homosexual. Therefore, he will not like her. 
For that reason, I can prove that too. He shall not regard the God of his fathers, which is a statement related to the Jews. He will be an apostate Jew, and he will not have any regard for the desire of women. And I've stated to you time and time again, Paul follows the steps of apostasy, and he says a man uh, or a nation does not retain God in their knowledge. Then they worship the creature more than the creator. Then they'll make an image to that creature, and then they will turn from the natural use one has for man for woman and will burn in their lust man for man, working things that are unseemingly. And then God gives them over to a reprobate mind. So I prove that, they, that he shall hate her and he's going to teach her how to sin. I believe that it will be close to Satan worship that goes on with this beast. He's going to do strange things with strange gods in strong places. He's going to do things that you can't imagine. And he's going to have power to pull fire from heaven and to perform miracles. And it is the devil that gives him his power. He is a demon worshiper. Therefore, the old, the old foolish worship of Roman Catholicism will be hated. And they'll finally give their power to those ten kings and turn on her and eat her. Because he comes into the temple and he says, all right now. Mama's not the boss religiously anymore. I am. Worship me. Now the Jews have made a covenant with him from Daniel 9 and 27 for one week, seven years. But Jews are monotheists and they believe in one God. That's the reason they wouldn't accept Jesus Christ. And, and, and when he says, I am God, they say, oh, 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 wait a minute now. We believe in one God. And so when he says, I'm God, they start throwing up their hand and start backing off. That's when he has power to overcome them and to kill them and kill them. He will. Then you see them standing in heaven singing the song of Moses <coughs> and the Lamb. Now, the 18th chapter are the different views of Babylon. The first part, I believe, is the view of angels. I differ with Mr. Schofield a little bit. Because he says... Uh, he saw an angel come down from heaven having great power and he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen. The angels are crying this. This is the angelic view. I, I believe that the latter view is the church's view, if I am correct in my thinking here. Let me follow it through for just a moment. Now the 18th chapter is talking about the view of this old woman. The ecclesiastical part of Rome. The church part. The Roman Catholic Church. It is both a political system, and you notice the other day, she had to put her two cents in about the Vietnam children. They, everything that happened, we got to call the Pope and ask him if it's all right. He'll give his blessings or he won't. Well, don't, don't be fooled, my friend. Underneath all that, she's not just a church, but she is a military power. If you don't believe that, you ask the Irishman over there today how well they can fight. And if you don't believe it, ask our missionaries that have been, have been killed in Colombia and South America by their priests. And I don't care what you say about it, my friend. When they send Holy Ghost preachers up against the wall and begin to shoot them and they got the collar backwards and they're wearing the priest robe of Rome, I'm telling you how the mop flops, that's the way she goes, and I'm against her. Amen? All right. But the angel says, Babylon is fallen, goody, goody, goody. Babylon is gone. That old church is gone, she's gone. Notice what is the first thing. It's become the habitation of that dragon. And is the hold, it's the place where every old foul spirit comes from. Well, now leave it to an angel to think of that. Because they have to fight the devil all the time. You see what I mean? They fuck the fight with him. And they say, well, that's where all these spirits have been coming from all the time. We wondered where their hole was. We wondered where the home was. That's where it was right there. That was the very place it's coming from all the time. That is the angelic view of Babylon. And said, all nations have drank with the wine of her wrath, the fornication of the kings of the earth, and so on. When you go down to the ninth verse, you'll see the human view of Babylon, the kings of the earth. This is a merchant's view. They start crying and weeping. Oh my, what are we going to do now? Because her ships and all of her money and all of the gold 
One, uh, one religious leader was leading uh, a preacher through uh, the uh, Vatican and was showing him the path of treasure. And the priest said, Sir, no longer does the church have to say, Silver and gold have I none. And the preacher said, Yeah, neither can the church say, Rise up and walk either. Amen. I'll tell you what, I'd rather be able to say, Silver and gold have I none. I, and be able to say rise up and walk than vice versa. All right. That is the human view of Babylon. Crying about the oil. Crying about the cinnamon, the wheat, the beef, the horses, the chariots, the slaves, and the souls of men. In the 13th chapter, Rome not only handles goods and money and riches, but she also buys souls of men. Praise God there is a delivery. For the soul of man, where nobody can buy it. All right? And we'll go on down, skip on down, if you will, to the 17th verse. And there's one thing I want you to notice. That they start saying, one hour. In one hour, she's fallen. Who would have believed it? She ruled. See, the Bible said they wonder after because she was dead, or she was alive, and didn't look like it was dead, and it comes alive again. So all the earth marvels after her. And now that she has fallen, we have ended. She had over 500 years of reign as an iron power. Then it became mingled with iron and clay from the time of Luther, from the time of the Reformation on up until the day in which we live. And it seems like she's dead, but she's going to come alive again, and the world's going to wonder after her. Then, my friend, it says that she's destroyed, and everybody's going to say, I can't believe it. In one hour... Such destruction has come. They're going to marvel that the power of God is able to destroy that old woman in one hour. But I'm telling you, she is going to be destroyed in a short time because my God has the power to do it. And then you have the other view of Babylon, which is mentioned on down. Then the 19th chapter is the hallelujah of the saints. Now I want to go back. I'm talking tonight about the delivery of of, of uh, the Jews and about God turning back to them. I've been preaching to this church here lately that God is getting His church ready for them to say, God, I know you're about through with the Gentile age. Get me Acts 15 where James stands up and says about the tabernacle of David being rebuilt and the time God is visiting the Gentiles for the bride. And then I'm going to Romans 11 tonight and wind it up there, if you will, for this particular uh, situation. Amen. But uh, I want you to see the picture tonight. I have drawn, before I, I get into these, I've drawn for you up on top here two witnesses. This is Moses and Elijah. They're fallen in the streets dead, and they're resurrected. Here is the mark of the beast. And here is the ecclesiastical uh, part of Rome. She is turned on by... These ten kings that hate her. And the church part of Rome falls. And all the angels are shout. And all the saints shout. But the merchants of the earth and the kings weep. Because it was kind of a, a, a good uh, uh, economic situation. But here represents the falling of Babylon. Now then, I'm going to go back for just a moment. And talk about how God... I've showed you how God is going to do it. In the, uh, with the two witnesses. But let's talk about it just a little more. Now, God loved the Jews. They were his people for those many years, 4,000 years. Read me what John, James said real loudly, Brother Russell. Men and brethren, hearken unto me. All right. Simeon was the first one that declared how the God visited Gentiles. To just take out, just visit. It's not a permanent stay. It's just a visit. He comes to visit the Gentiles to take out a people for his name. And this agrees about the tabernacle of David, which means a tent out of plumb. It's not a permanent building. It's just a tent out of plumb. That's what, that's what the prophet says. Gentiles, really, you are not a permanent structure. You are a tent out of plumb. Read it and I'll prove it to you. I'll build again the tabernacle data. I want you to see it. And the original says, a tent out of plumb, which means it is not a permanent 
set up building but a temporary thing. It ties in with what he said. I visited the Gentiles. All that you and I have had is a visit from God. But on that visit, May 14th, 1948, the same day that Israel was made a nation, a little cotton-headed kid got the Holy Ghost in Crawford, Texas. Hallelujah. And on the visit of that God, I was still with the Holy Ghost and I became part and lot of that church. Hallelujah. Now then, I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk about Romans 9 and 10 and 11. And I'll say this in general first. Romans 9 is the sovereignty of God. It looks like that man doesn't have anything to say about his salvation, that God does it. But Romans 10 comes along and it talks about man's free will. And he ties that in. And Romans 11 ties them together. That it is calling an election, but you are the one that's supposed to make it sure or tie it down. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He calls you, He chooses you, but you have to respond and you have to come in. All right. Now, He talks about Israel. He said, Israel, it, uh, He said, I'll tell you what belonged to them. I'm going to give you this, quote it, and, and, and not take time to read it. He said, to them belong the oracles of God. To them belong the promises. To them belong the inheritance and the birthright. Everything belongs to them. But what happened? He said, did they stumble that they should fall in the original? He said, did they stumble that they should fall in, into ruin? The falling there is into ruin completely. And the May construction expects a negative answer in the Greek. No. But they have stumbled or have they have made a misstep, the original says. They have not stumbled into ruin, but they've only made a misstep. But he said, by that misstep and by that one little fall, the Gentiles were brought in. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Now that's the way it was. Now really it belonged to them. Yes. Now didn't they know? He asked the question, what? Did not Israel know? Yeah, they knew. What? Did not they hear? Yeah, they heard. He goes on and says, how can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach except to be sent? He said, they heard. And then he tells funny how they heard. He said, because Moses testified to them. He said, he is nigh thee even in thy mouth, if you'll, if you'll trace it back to where they got the Scripture from. God is nigh thee even in thy mouth. Then he said, yes, they heard, for verily their sound went from one end of heaven to the other. You know where it's quoting from? It's from the Psalms. The heavens declare the work of God and the firmament His power. There is no speech nor language where there is not heard. Verily, their sound has gone from one end of heaven to the other. God condemned the Jews with the preaching of Moses and David in the Psalms. He said, yes, they heard, but they didn't believe. And because of that unbelief, they were cut off. But if the fall of them became your salvation... What shall the bringing them back in be but life from the dead? Now Paul uses two illustrations. He starts one and doesn't carry it through very far. He uses the leaven and the lump. He said if the lump is holy, so is, is the whole. That You take a big water dough and if it's got yeast in it, you squeeze off a little bit, it'll have some yeast in it. You see what I mean? He doesn't carry that analogy very far. But you don't add the yeast extemporaneously. You don't add it to the little chunk you take off. Mama make them old cat head biscuits, somebody said, and she squeezed that off. And whatever that had in it, the whole had in it, the lump have a little bit of it. She didn't add salt and pepper, and, no, no pepper, but salt and, and, and whatever. That would be some kind of biscuit, wouldn't it? But she didn't add all the things. What do you put in biscuits anyway? She didn't put that in the little bitty biscuit. She put that in the hole. All right. But he doesn't carry that analogy very far. But the next one, he takes a long way. He said, let me take the tree, for example. Let me take the fig tree. Let me take that olive tree. Either one of them are symbols. He said, now, really, really, they're broken off. And you were grafted in. You were an ah, wild olive tree. You were a wild one. This thing is right backwards to the way a botanist would do it, or a farmer, or whatever he is. You see, you take a, 
You take a wild tree and you graft a good one in. You see what I mean? You don't take a good stork pecan and graft in a little penny winkle native pecan into that. But you take the sturdiness of the wild one and you graft in the refinement. You see what I mean? But my God, He called the Jew a good olive tree and He called us a wild one. And He went contrary to nature and He grafted, He broke off some branches and He grafted a wild one in. And He said, so stop boasting. The original says, stop boasting. Because if good ones are broken off, what makes you think you won't be? Amen. And he shows God's power. If God is able to take a wild one and graft it in, how much is it easier for him to take the one that belongs in that tree and graft right back in? And he said, yes, verily, God will graft them in again. Now, he goes down, and I've got to give it to you as I come to a close. Let me read it. Now, boast not against the branches, and it says, stop boasting. Uh, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You didn't come, you didn't start there. We, we, we didn't start from the root. We're branches. And, well, we're going down. Thou wilt say that the branches are broken off, that I may be grafted well, because of unbelief. They were broken off, that thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee is goodness. Otherwise, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still, and this is duratively written, if they do not continue, if they will not continue abiding in unbelief, shall be grafted in. Glory, glory. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, were grafted in contrary to nature in a good olive tree, how much more shall these which have been natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. I say it's a mystery how God is fixing to turn back to the Jew. But He's fixing to do it. And this Gentile church is coming to a close. It's a mystery how that we even got in. And it's more of a mystery how that God's fixing to bring them back in. But I believe that I'm preaching in the last hours of the Gentile church in this world. Read on down. For I would not have you to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceit, that blindness or hardness in part is happen unto Israel or to Israel until the fullness and the original says until the full number of Gentiles be come in and then Israel shall be saved. Have you got it? So blindness has happened to them until the full number of the Gentiles be come in and then all Israel shall be saved. God will graft them in again. Thank God. And I will send a deliverer. He'll turn away from the ungodliness of Jacob. For this covenant that I made with him, I'll take away their sins. And he goes on and talks about there. There is no regret with God. The gifts and callings of God are without regret, the original says. He doesn't back up and regret what he has done. But I'm telling you that I have brought you several times to the same place right here. That this church is fixing to go home and be with the Lord. This Gentile church. That's all he wanted was a visit here. And then he's going to go back to the Jews and he's going to let them rule and reign. He promised them and he said it could happen. And he said it would happen. Thank God the devil's going to be bound and they're going to rule from the Nile to the Euphrates. That's going to be their country. There'll be other nations outside of that, but they're going to have to go up Jerusalem to worship. Oh, brother, something's going to happen to the spirits of men Something's going to happen to every animal. It says that a child shall play upon the hole of an asp. And it's not going to hurt that child. It's not going to sting it anymore. If you know what an asp is, it's a little bitty uh, worm type thing. Well, I guess that's what we used to have out in West Texas. And if you sit down on one, you'll rise again. But they're not going to hurt you. I believe wasps are going to quit stinging. And serpents are going to quit biting. Oh, yeah. 
You're going to look up the road and you're going to see a little child coming and he's going to have one arm flung over a bear and one flung over a lion and going to waddle down the road like it's a couple of dogs. Something's going to happen because the devil is going to be bound. And God says, I'm going to give the Jews the rule of peace upon this world that they have been asking for. And everything last night I thought was tremendous in that I showed how that the nations have aligned and have come right down to the place that we're living in now. The Antichrist is ready to be introduced. He's ready to be announced. And the church is filling up. Praise God. Brother Andrews came to me last night and was up here, was praying with Sister Subtle Night here, and, uh, and he said, you know, wouldn't it be something if this is that last one that makes up the full number of the Gentile church? If we're travailing and we're praying. God has got a last saint somewhere in this world, and when He fills that one with the Holy Ghost, it's going to mean that completed number. He's always dealt in fullness. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all accord in one place. And when the fullness of the Gentiles become in, I believe God is going to take us on home with Him. Praise God. He's got a last saint somewhere in this world. And I intend to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's going to be a wonderful place. I believe that we'll reign. We'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You and I will reign as kings and priests. Praise God. While the Jews reign as kings on this earth. Praise God. This is the millennium. <laughs> We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're caught up. The fourth chapter of Revelation is the marriage supper of the Lamb. We return with Him according to Thessalonians at the battle of Armageddon to be glorified with Him. Thank God. And then we, we see the city of God coming down over the earth. You see it coming down. Hallelujah. The devil's put in, in the bottomless pit. He's chained. And you and I, I believe the holy city shall be suspended. It was coming down. That it is in a state of coming down. It does not come fully but is in a state of coming down. You see what I mean? There is a, an idea and a thought that it is, is going on. It is coming down. Hallelujah to God. Now when the new heaven and new earth comes, there's going to be the holy city. Then it says the gates are not going to be open at all, are not going to be shut at all. We can go in and out. We're the bride. Hallelujah. But on this earth, it's going to go on. You're going to build houses and inhabit them. Children are going to be born. Not going to be any meanness anymore. Just a few things. I'll tell you about what it's going to be like. We're going to build houses and inhabit them, I said. We're going to plant. Those that live around Jerusalem and not of Jews are going to have to go up or don't rain on their crops. They have to go up. This is the plague that shall be on Egypt if they go not up. There'll be no rain on their crops. So they've got to go up. Hallelujah. The Jews are the ones that are ruling. They're ruling the whole earth. Ten men, as I said, take hold of the skirt of one Jew and say, we hear God is with you. Let's go up and worship. And so they go up and worship. Hallelujah. I believe the 144,000 that have been slain by the beast and are resurrected in the 14th chapter and are standing on Mount Zion, I believe that they will be the go-between between the literal physical saints or physical Jews in this world here and between that holy city because you've got resurrected and you've got unresurrected people to deal with. Dying will be going on in the millennium. Some will die. Oh, I can't hardly wait till Thursday night to tell you that a child being a hundred years old will die, but a sinner that is accursed will die at a hundred. Amen. Oh yeah. But I'm going to tell you what. It's going to be a glorious thing for the church because we will be taken out. Watch and pray that you may be accounted worthy to go fly out of these things 
that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man in that day and in that hour.